How's it going ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donnie here again. This time we're going to take a look at energy, specifically work and heat. So our objectives are to describe what energy is, the common units to describe quantities of energy, and to describe different ways energy is transferred, as well as describe what is meant by a closed system and its surroundings. So first question, well, what is energy? Well, an oversimplification is just simply the capacity to do work right so the wind has energy as the wind's blowing it's blowing past this wind turbine and it can cause the turbine to spin doing work so that wind has energy because it has the potential to do work forms of energy well we got kinetic energy kinetic energy is associated with motion so like whether you're a pitcher throwing a baseball and giving it kinetic energy or just kind of vibrating in place it has to do with motion so if we're talking about translation motion where things are moving across a distance uh, we got this kind of equation for kinetic energy it's equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared right then there's also thermal energy which also known as heat and it typically has to do with uh, like molecules and atoms vibrating and moving past each other so most of the time we're thinking micro scale for this uh, but it's a type of kinetic energy because you know the higher the heat the more motion there is uh, so right now i have this little star and it's spinning and vibrating kind of in place at a given temperature well if i were to increase the temperature what happens is it would start spinning and start vibrating start moving faster because it has more kinetic energy and there's also potential energy so potential energy can be uh, from like things like gravity uh, for example, if you had a rock on top of a giant mountain, it has a lot of potential en energy because of gravity. If the rock were to fall off of that mountain, it could convert all that stored energy into kinetic energy. There's electrostatic potential energy, which is basically like if you ever play with two magnets, you know that opposite charges attract. So there is a stored energy between them because they are a certain distance away. And the amount of energy stored from electrostatic charges is a function of their charges over their distance. So the further away they are, the uh, the less energy that they have. Uh, chemical energy, uh, like the bonds and molecules and, and compounds, right? That's a, a form of stored energy. If you were to break those bonds and make new bonds, you might release more energy or you might absorb some energy in order to make those new bonds. That's all a form of potential energy. So how do we quantify it? How do we know how much? How do we describe how much? Well, the unit that we use to describe how much energy is called the joule. And the joule is one of those pesky units where it's actually made of other units, uh, which might come in handy down the road. So, for example, one joule is one kilogram times meters squared divided by seconds squared and you might think well how am i going to remember that well if you already remember the kinetic equation or the formula for kinetic energy you could just think what units would you plug in well for mass it would be my kilograms what would be your units for velocity well it'd be meters per second and then you're squaring that and that's how you end up with kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared is equal to a joule so basically, you know, like a two kilogram object going one meter per second would have one joule of energy. Kinetic energy, I should say. More often than not, though, we'll probably be working with the kilojoule. So kilo means a thousand, right? A joule typically is too small for measuring quantities of energy that you're working with more often than not. So one kilojoule is equal to a thousand joules. And another unit that we probably won't ever look at ever again is uh, the calorie, abbreviated lowercase c-a-l, right? So if you ever looked on a nutritional label, you can see they always list calories. That's literally how much energy is in that food, right? You need calories to live. Your heart needs energy for pumping. You need your heart, you know, need to breathe. You need to move around. You need that energy. That's where the calories come into play. Now, the old definition for what a calorie is uh, was the amount of energy it took to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. But we've changed that. Most of our, you know, American units are actually defined based off of metric units. So, you know, we should probably just go metric. But, you know, I'm the crazy one. So currently we define one calorie as exactly 4.18 joules. So that's an exact definition. Then there's also the nutritional calorie, which is what you're actually seeing on labels. It's... uh actually a thousand 
normal calories. So there's, you know, this capital C is important. The capital C is saying it's 1,000 calories, right? So one calorie with a capital C is equal to 1,000 calories with a lowercase c. And the abbreviation is, you know, one capital C-A-L is equal to 1,000 lowercase C-A-L. Yeah, our system of measurement's great, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Just uppercase, lowercase, totally different things. Anyway, so when we're studying energy and transferring of energy, we have to specify like what we're looking at and what we're focused on. So we have the system, which is the part of the universe that we're paying attention to. So I have this beautiful picture of the a coast of Maine. Now this whole thing in the picture could be my system, or, you know, maybe I'm more focused on what's happening in just that tidal pool. You know, if I'm a scientist that's is studying tidal pools, this might be my system. In which case, what do we call everything else? Call everything else the surroundings, right? So it's literally everything else. But, you know, if, you know, I was more interested in something else, like maybe I'm interested in the, uh, you know, above the tidal plane, I'm interested in that, that would be my system. And then everything else would be my surroundings, right? It's just, what are we focused on? So an example is, let's say we're interested, interested in the potential energy change during chemical reaction, right? You mix two chemicals, they heat up or they cool off, you're interested in that. Uh, well, then you would want to measure the amount of heat gained or lost by your system to determine the change in potential energy. So the system could be the chemicals reacting. That's what's going on, right? And then our surroundings would be everything else. It would be the water that they're reacting in. So if I go, all right, well, what's happening with my chemicals? You could look to see what's happening to your surroundings so you know what's happening to your system. If your surroundings all of a sudden has more energy, then you know that your system must have lost energy because where did it come from? A closed system. It's important to talk about closed systems. So closed systems uh, are ones where energy can flow between the system and the surroundings, but matter cannot. So energy can come in and go out, but matter can't. So think of like a bottle of soda, right? If you have a closed bottle, an unopened one, that's a closed system. You can cool it off. You can heat it up. If you leave it out, it'll get warmer. You can put it in the fridge. It'll get colder. But none of the contents are changing, right? Which is not the case if you have an open bottle. That would be an open system. In that kind of system, the carbonation could escape from your bottle of soda and it would go flat, right? That wouldn't be a closed system because there's matter, that carbonation, leaving your system. So energy transfers can happen in two ways. One is changes in temperature or heat. So they can transfer heat. You can see in this picture, there is heat being added to, uh, you know, this stick of wax or whatever it is. Uh, or it can cause motion of an object. For example, you know, I got this guy, maybe it's Prometheus, and he's pushing the boulder up the hill forever, having his liver picked out and whatever. Anyway. He could be transferring energy that he's got in his muscles and from his food and stuff into the boulder and pushing it up the hill by doing work. So we got these two ways of transfer energy. So let's talk about heat. A classic calorimetry lab is you have an aqueous solution. Uh, you got two different solutions with different chemicals in it and you mix them together. The chemicals react and they're either going to give off heat or they're going to absorb heat, which means the temperature of our solution is going to change. If that reaction is giving off heat, it's going to get warmer. If that reaction is absorbing heat, our solution is going to get colder. So then you can measure that temperature change and figure out, well, what does that mean for the energy change of my chemicals? So in this example, the system might be the chemical reaction. That's a part of the universe that I'm interested in. Uh, and then the surroundings, the thing that I'm going to measure so I know what's happening to my system, might be the water in the calorimeter. So I'm going to look at the calorimeter and the temperature change so I can figure out the heat change of my system. All right, so heat's transferred from the system to the surroundings or vice versa. Maybe the surroundings has the energy and it's being absorbed by the system. Then there's work. So work is energy used to cause an object to move against a force a certain distance. So an example could just be simply a ball rolling down a hill, right? You got this weirdo guy standing on top of this hill, rolling boulders or something. He's bowling down a hill. So the force would be gravity. Gravity is pulling on those boulders. And the distance would really depend on how big of the hill is, right? So this distance that the ball is traveling would be my distance. So the amount of work being done is represented by this equation. Work equals force times distance. So if you apply the same force over a greater distance, you do more work. 
So an example, let's say, you know, you're grabbing a plate from the cabinet and you, you let go. I don't know why. Maybe you got scared and you dropped it. Gravity's pulling on the plate towards the ground. So that'd be my force, right? The force from gravity. It falls through the air a certain distance. There's my force and distance. What I have is potential energy being converted into kinetic energy, right? We have that stored energy of the plate being released and the plate's moving. Now, when the plate hits the ground, the kinetic energy is being converted into work, right? It might break the plate. That's some work that it's doing. And the rest of the energy is being released as heat. So all of that potential energy that was stored from gravity has now been released either into heat or the work being done to break the plate. So in this example, the system would probably be my plate and the surroundings would be everything else. You know, so in this example, energy is transferred from plate to the surroundings. So summarize, can you describe what energy is, the common units to describe quantities of energy, and describe different ways energy is transferred, as well as describe what is meant by a closed system and its surroundings? I hope so. If not, I'm sorry. Goodbye.